Focus on Headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, uh, joining us in the studio, we have our Sochi sisters in Kwanzaa and Chejihi. Guys, welcome back. One, two, three. Good, Good evening. evening. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> now, it, it went from you guys kind of looking at each other, hey, let's not uh, say good evening at the same time to now going one, two, three. Uh, and that was not even pre-planned. <laughs> yeah. I just did it right now. I mean, you know, some people, they just kind of really, really click. Uh, you know, me and Youngdae, we have that time to time. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's good to see you guys once again. Good to see you. Uh, we are, we're going to start things off. Um, it's been really, I mean, I can't believe it's already been over three years now. And, uh, you know, we've been doing this program together for uh, over three years now. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things that we've covered extensively in the first two years was COVID-19. In fact, that was the first thing that we talked about at the very start of Focus on Headline. We haven't done so much of that uh, as of late uh, due to all the easing of restrictions and so forth. So it is um, interesting that we're going to be starting things off with COVID-19 today. Uh, we've kind of seen actually uh, rising cases actually I believe on Monday uh, was it Wednesday they saw a, a three month high in the uh, daily COVID-19 cases so it's not really an end to the COVID-19 pandemic but uh, as President Yoon se said this Thursday declaring most and uh, the end of most restrictions to the virus that has been plaguing us for more than three years now we do have some changes in other measures here so so uh You've been gracing us with COVID-19 information uh, for the first two years of the pandemic. Uh, so you're going to start us off with the latest here. Uh, what kind of uh, latest information on the COVID-19 front do you have for us? Well, President Yoon seok um declaration kind of was a de facto announcement of the transition from a pandemic to an endemic. President Yoon presided over the COVID-19 response meeting of the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters at the presidential office this Thursday where he announced the adjustment of the crisis level of COVID-19. It'll be downgraded from serious to alert starting from June 1st. In his open remarks, he mentioned he is pleased that the nation's people will return to their everyday lives after three years and four months. And he laid out some of the changes coming up. Uh, the seven-day mandatory isolation period will be changed to a five-day isolation recommendation and there will be changes to people PCR tests upon arrival at airports, mask rules are to be entirely lifted, but I think Chi will have more mm. details on those later on. Uh, President Yoon noted that when he made visits to hospitals and other medical facilities, he really felt how much of efforts medical personnel have been doing over the years, and it, that it's really thanks to them that we could overcome the pandemic. Uh, he further on expressed thanks to the medical people who fought against the virus, uh, with uh, some of them being uh, there at the meeting today, uh, and he also asked for uh, the officials to give an applause. So everyone actually had a standing ovation for the medical personnel at the meeting today. So President Yoon also mentioned not only uh, the doctors, but nurses and also uh, those who uh, were in charge of uh, making vaccines or actually, I mean, we did use vaccines from abroad first, but mm -hmm. then we also had our own research. And uh, President Yoon also emphasized how the country was able to fight the pandemic based on science and said, uh, without making it a political issue. I think from time to time, there were also political issues when we talked about social distancing, for instance. Um, there were some times when uh, people thought that uh, some politicians wanted social distancing to be stronger and mm. others wanted them to li be lifted. But all in all, uh, our COVID-19 responses were based on science is what he wanted to stress. Yeah, I think we can certainly argue that uh, COVID-19 was at political at the most minimum, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at the United States, everything was like politics, right? Like if, you, if you wear a mask, you represented the, the, the mm -hmm. Democratic. The, the, and then if you were against the mask, you were a Republican. And like it was re getting ridiculous. And you're right here, despite the fact that there was a huge uh, you know, rift amongst the, the the supporters and the followers of the two main uh, political parties. It had nothing to do with mask wearing or like the the vaccination or anything like that, which was uh, really good. But again, like it's, I thought that 
when the day comes that we finally talk about this end of COVID-19 pandemic, I thought it was going to be very emotional. Because, uh, mm. I mean, it, it, three years, right? Over three years. But because I think we started lifting these measures like in an incremental level and mm. like it was kind of we slowly phased out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Maybe that's the reason why we didn't really feel it. Right. And we're still mm. seeing cases and there's still, you know, people around us getting COVID-19 and things like that. But still, uh, this is. Uh, certainly uh, a huge change that we are seeing a stark contrast to what we saw obviously some three years ago but still though um lifting nearly all of the COVID-19 restrictions here in the country like still leaving mixed feelings of excitement or maybe a sense of relief maybe uh even concern so uh because <laughs> as we know sometimes one of the trends that we saw is when we start lifting these measures is when we start having spike in cases right and so to be honest I think I changed. <laughs> Th- that is remarkable. <laughs> that is where re- Soa was one of the last persons to uh, have her face mask off. Right. Uh, and so, you know, again, we're, I, I guess all of us now. Are- I-, I still try to wear it, it as much as possible, but I think I kind of rely on my immunity now. Yeah, she does have some ridiculous <laughs> immunity uh, for our listeners out there, but still, these changes and details, because we have so many of them, it's hard to kind of track. So, yeah. let's kind of go into the details of what will change uh, regarding the current quarantine measures and when this will be uh, implemented. Gee, you have more on this. Right. Well, first of all, though we've seen a gradual lifting of all these measures, I still feel very emotional and excited about mm-hmm. this change because we're finally going back to uh, pre pandemic times and uh, seeing normalcy again. Well, to uh, tell you the changes in more detail, like Soa said, the government will lower the national crisis level of the pandemic from serious to alert, and this will begin in June. And almost all antivirus measures will be lifted starting uh, this period. Now, the government's recent announcement aligns with the World Health Organization's recent declaration, which was made on the 5th of May, that the virus that lasted three long years is no longer a global health emergency. Now, with the government's alleviation of the quarantine measures, major changes will be witnessed starting next month. And the biggest change would be, like Soa said briefly, isolation period for COVID-19 patients, uh, because the mandatory isolation period period for the confirmed patients will be reduced from the current seven days, which was mandatory, uh, to five days, and this is only this will only be recommended. Uh, however, the government deems it necessary to maintain the measure in vulnerable facilities, so it requested uh, such institutions and facilities to agree on the recommended isolation period, voluntarily at least. And the indoor mask mandate, which was lifted in most places at the end of January, will be lifted further to cover almost everywhere except for hospitals with rooms for hospitalizations. Uh, and the mandatory wearing of masks in clinics and pharmacies will now only be recommended ended. However, the indoor mask mandate will be maintained in general hospitals and large medical facilities where people are more vulnerable to catching infectious diseases. And the recommended PCR test for inbound travelers will also be lifted. Uh, This is also good news because it was a hassle to get yourself tested every time you come to the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, And also, except for the medical facilities designated for PCR testing, we had the uh, temporary testing centers. There were nine that have been set up across the country, they will stop operating as well. So what will remain the same is the government's provision of financial assistance related to COVID-19 treatment, and this includes free vaccinations and medicine, as well as paid sick leaves and quarantine supplies that are needed for the patients. Uh, And also, while the KDCA has been been announcing new confirmed cases on a daily basis, uh, this will now be changed to a weekly basis. Yeah, and it seems like with the five-day quarantine recommendation, right, it's not, you know, it's not mandatory. Mm -hmm. So we're sort of kind of uh, treating this uh, like a flu. Uh, Even with the flu, it's recommended that you don't come to work. It's just that, you know, the flu has been around for such a long time that some people, even though they have the flu, just come to work. Uh, but I think things have really changed quite a bit, uh, especially if you're sick. Uh, we, you, For our listeners out there, you guys have seen us on live YouTube. Uh, if any of our listeners or our guests were sick, we had our masks on, things like that. Although I have to say, like with the hospitals and clinics and stuff, like you still have to wear the mask. Because the, the other day I went to the clinic and uh, the person who was sitting next to me turned out uh, he tested positive mm-hmm. for influenza. And I was like, oh my goodness, good thing mm-hmm. I had the mask on uh, and things like that. So... 
Ladies and gentlemen, um, sure, uh, it seems like almost all of the measures are done and over with here, but uh, we do still have to be practice caution here. Um, we're going to go into uh, so, uh, what President Yoon underlined in his remark today. Again, uh, three years and four months, believe it or not, since uh, COVID-19 was first reported here in South Korea. Um, I know it's going to be really, really long, but walk us through some of the major events during this period. Sure. So uh, I think everyone in this studio at least remembers the day when Korea had its first COVID-19 case. SJ, quiz for you. I do remember uh, because it was on a uh, it was on like a weekend. There were it was a weekend. And they remember we had the tracking device. Okay, already wrong. It was a weekday. <laughs> it was was it a weekday? Oh, and it was January. Okay, guys. No. <laughs> okay, I will walk you through. No, sorry. I do, I okay. remember. I remember the seventh. I remember the seventh. Uh, uh, what is it? Patient. Patient number seven. I remember. Why was it a friend of yours? No, because that was the person that got caught at a hotel, and oh, uh, I remember. everybody okay. remembers it. That's when we had the tracking right. App application, mm-hmm. right? And so everyone was looking yeah. at the application. But go ahead. Right. So okay, twenty twenty January twentieth was the day when Korea had its first case of COVID nineteen. Now I actually personally remember because I uh, moved to a new apartment on that day. Oh. And that's why I remember I could not be on radio that day. So it was a week day, I remember. Mm, okay. So that was when we had the first COVID patient in Korea, an imported case from China. Uh, and immediately an alert level was initiated. It was the alert level, actually. And in February, the highest level, the serious level. And then in February, on February 29th, social distancing was first declared. And after that, uh, in steps, we had uh, different kinds of uh, social distancing levels. And also, you guys probably remember the mask rotation system, because at first we thought we would run out of masks. That why That's why we could only purchase masks yeah, on yeah. specific days. It really worked well here in Korea. Uh, and uh, then... Um, on t- in 2021 February, vaccination started. First, it was for the medical personnel. And then in 2021 summer, that's when the highest social distancing measures at level four were implemented in the metropolitan region. So although we had started with vaccination, cases also started to surge. Uh, And back then, I think it was the Delta variant that especially uh, emerged. And uh, we had more and more stricter social distancing measures from then on. I think the most strictest were after six o'clock, you could not get together in in groups of three. I can't it, believe this mm, all happened. I know, I know. And you couldn't go to coffee shops. You only right. could have takeout and things oh, like that. God. Yeah, that was the worst for me, really. I love going to coffee shops. Uh, <laughs> and then also um, the funerals and uh, wedding ceremonies, all of that had to be reduced. Uh, then in 2021, November, that's when the government had announced its so-called with corona uh, strategy, meaning a step-by-step return to normal. That's also when we had those QR code systems. Uh, Whenever we wanted to get into a facility, we had to check whether we were vaccinated or not. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, the return to normal did not last that long because in December, the Omicron variant popped up. And that really led to surges in cases. It spread much faster than the Delta variant. And uh, then it came to the day when we had more than 620,000 cases in just a day. It's still really surreal just looking at the number, right. more than half a million cases in just a day. And then also uh, that was in March 2022. And in, also in March 2022, one day we had a total of 469 fatalities in just a day. So we had all of those record highs uh, in 2022. But the thing is, that's also the year when we then started to, again, lift restrictions. And that's because almost everyone started to get infected. Uh, So it's kind of that Korea also went to its kind of herd immunity strategy because Mm -hmm. most of the people got the Omicron variant. Uh, So then step by step, we did lift uh, the restrictions, but also fortunately, infections uh, decreased as well later in the year. And now we are in year 2023, are we? Because it really even seems surreal that we already are in 2023. 
free, right. but uh, then we gradually lifted mask mandates. Uh, as she said, um, it's only the you know hospital uh, facilities where these mask mandates still have to be uh, lifted later in June. Uh, so those are the major. Um, I should say the major incidents, although, as SJ mentioned, the seventh uh, patient, there were in between many, many cases that we can also remember of and also those group infections at various facilities. Uh, and last but not least, how is it looking now? Recently, do you guys know how many infections we actually have? I, you know, Yonap doesn't even have the COVID tab anymore. That's mm exactly what I checked today as well. <laughs> if you go to the um, Tenan portal uh, category, you get, get the weather. You get the weather. Yeah, I know. Uh, so what I saw in a report today is that in the uh, past week, in a week, we have more than uh, 100,000 cases. And uh, in also in the past, uh, until the 10th of this uh, month that is, we had in a month 239 COVID 19 deaths. So that is the number that I have. So, so a high number. Yeah, so we talk about weekly numbers or monthly yeah, numbers yeah, yeah, now. Yeah. Um, I, man, I, again, it's it felt so long, right? Um, but now that we've kind of gone through three months, uh, three years and four months, it just feels like it just happened. We breezed through it, but we, we, so much went through. Again, every now that you went through all of this, like I remember every bits and pieces of right. it, right? Mm -hmm. Like I remember having to, uh, my son's uh, first birthday, uh, the Toljanchi, we, we had to cancel it because mm -hmm. uh, my in-laws are all from Daegu. And as you know, Daegu was where like it was kind of, there was a big outbreak in Daegu at the time, right? And so all of this, and then, you know, having to, Wait in the uh, the lines in the the pharmacy and then prove that I was you know at a certain year and then get my three masks that you're allowed to purchase. All of this, I mean, it it just really does feel like uh, yesterday. But um, really, I I I, I want to take this time, by the way, mm. uh, to not only thank all of you, the the medical staff uh, and all those people that were at the testing sites and so forth, but. Soa, once again, was doing the COVID stuff, uh, right. not only on television, but on our show as well for, you know, what, like two years or so. And so I, I have to give it to you. I mean, it was it was Aww. amazing work that you did. But <laughs> I was always saying it's not easy to talk about. At the time, it wasn't easy to talk about COVID-19 and deaths and all mm, this just on a day. daily basis because psychologically, mentally, I'm sure it affected you as well. Uh, but uh, you did a fantastic job for us on our program and on television as well. And Thank I'm, you. I'm and glad I, I that you're not doing it anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? I'm glad that I don't have to talk about uh, all these uh, infections and right. deaths on a daily basis. But I have to say, while reporting on COVID-19 every day, mm -hmm. I kind of felt that I was really sensitive uh, regarding the virus as well. That's why I kind of felt I was socially distancing much more than other people. I hardly ate with anyone together. Even right. here at Arirang, I was mm -hmm. always eating alone when no one was uh, near me. That's uh, how much I tried to not get infected because I have to be the person who has to yeah. report about it. It was, I I mean, it's just uh, unbelievable. Um, again, um, it's not a full end uh, to the pandemic just yet, but uh, I mean, we've gone to the worst of it. And I think uh, that the fear that we had, I think in the beginning, it's, it's gone and over with. Uh, so, and that's good. So. Hopefully, uh, you know, if there's, you know, experts were saying there's a 10-year cycle. Every 10 years, there seems to be like a big pandemic that mm. goes on. And so if there is another pandemic come seven years from now or, you know, whatever it may be, uh, we might be more ready for this is uh, what we're trying to say. But uh, too many lies uh, were lost. Well, we're going to be talking about medical workers uh, now, uh, those that were really uh, the true heroes uh, during the pandemic. But uh, nurses and doctors... Uh, they've begun their second protest against the conflict over the country's nursing act. Uh, this has been the big thing here. 13 healthcare institutions, they went on a partial strike starting today, and this is expected to cause a considerable disruption in the operation of uh, medical facilities here in the country. So, Chi, you have more on this. Right. So there's an ongoing conflict between nurses and other medical workers, including doctors, over the National Assembly's passing of a bill uh, legislating the Nursing Act. Now, independent from the Medical Services Act, this uh, proposed nursing law clarifies the scope of nurses' work 
and improve their uh, to improve their working conditions. And the aim of this is to resolve nurses' frequent complaints over the ambiguity of their duties, roles, which have been outlined in the Medical Services Act that they claim have increased their workload. And I guess this became more apparent during the pandemic period. Uh, nurses, however, although the other people in the group are opposing it, nurses seem to be the only group welcoming the legislation as other medical workers groups, such as the Korean Medical Association, which includes doctors, are clearly opposing it. And this time, dentists are also joining the second protest by suspending their medical examinations. And so this is happening on a bigger scale. So the protest is expected to have a bigger consequence in the medical field field and the whole uh, treatment within the country. While the first strike consisted mainly of nurses, this time emergency rescuers, care center staff members and others are expected to join. And doctors claim that the new legislation allows uh, nurses the right to perform medical services without the guidance of a physician, including the right to open their own clinics. And on the other hand, nurses claim the act benefits not only them nurses, but allows patients to be safely cared for, especially in remote areas that lack medical centers with doctors. Uh, The Korean Nurses Association argues that with the population aging rapidly, the role of nurses must change with more dedication to community care. And this includes health management through visiting elderly people in need of care. Now, on the 3rd, that's when the first protest happened. Some 20,000 nation uh, clinics nationwide went on strike and there were some 3,000 in the capital, Seoul. Uh, Since the second round will be bigger in scale, it's recommended that you you call clinics and hospitals before visiting them because they might suspend their operating uh, or even close earlier than usual. And the government held an emergency review regarding this yesterday to prepare for any disruptions in treatment and promised that uh, they will work closely with the fire department as well as the emergency medical institutions to ensure that patients can be treated in a timely manner. You know, what's interesting is on the outside, it really doesn't seem like a big issue. But if you look deeper into it, there is a reason why there's a huge rift Mm -hmm. because... The argument is basically also that, you know, the nursing assistants, right? They're coming out and saying, whoa, 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 with this nursing act, we're not getting the same rights as the nurses. But the argument is, well, you guys don't study uh, the same amount as the nurses do. I mean, that's, you know, and then, you know, they're going, well, the nurses, they have to go at least three years of, uh, you know, studies and things like that. They have to come out of a university or a college, whereas nursing assistants, they could come out of academies is what it is. And so, like, the studying is different is what the argument was. And then through that argument, the doctors were like, look, we go through so much more studying than the nurses. You guys cannot open a clinic and perform uh, duties that we do when we have more studies in the medical field. And so, like, it, it just the, the, the trickle effect in these arguments are, are just very vast right now and uh, we'll have to see whether or not uh, how much this is going to impact all of us uh, especially with the the, the medical f- facilities that's always a big concern uh, we're going to move on to some diplomatic affairs this time so it seems like we have a clearer picture on the summit meeting in uh, Japan's uh, Hiroshima this is for the uh, the, the G7 summit uh, which uh, South Korean President Yoon suk will be involved Right. So the G7 will be held from the 19th to 21st this month in Hiroshima. And Japan's Sankei Shimbun said that adjustments are being made on a bilateral meeting between South Korea's uh, President Yoon suk yeol and uh, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida and a trilateral along with the U.S. President Joe Biden. And this is now expected to be on the 21st, according to the report. So that would be the last day of the G7 summit. And And of course, this is uh, on the sidelines. And we know that uh, South Korea is a non-G7 member, but has been invited by Prime Minister Kishida. And according to the report, the Japanese government is looking to speed up the normalization of Seoul-Tokyo ties and strengthen security cooperation between Seoul, Washington and Tokyo on the occasion of the summit meetings. Now, this would make uh, President Yoon and uh, Prime Minister Kishida visit each other for the third time in two months because we just recently had uh, almost just recently had two summit meetings 
And uh, also what's significant at uh, the meeting is or uh, on the sidelines is that President Yoon and Prime Minister Kishida are going to make a visit to the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. And that's going to be uh, in a gesture to uh, visit the Korean victims of the atomic bomb incident. And that would be actually a first for a South Korean uh, president, acting president, and also uh, for the first time since Obuchi Keijo, uh, prime minister from Japan uh, in 1999. It's also going to be, to be the first time since then that a Japanese prime minister makes such a visit as well. So uh, this visit by the two will be kind of another symbol of uh, improving ties between uh, the two countries. Now, more diplomacy on the high level for President Yoon uh, even earlier before the G7 summit comes up next Wednesday uh, as President Yoon is to have a one-on-one with his Canadian counterpart, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in Seoul. And that marks the 60th anniversary of diplomatic ties between South Korea and Canada. According to South Korea's presidential office spokesperson late last night, this will be a three-day official visit starting on Tuesday next week. President Yoon visited Canada last September. The two leaders are to share their vision for future cooperation, and uh, they will also celebrate the history of friendship and cooperation based on shared universal values such as freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. You know uh, what's interesting is, remember, it used to be G8 uh, back in the days, and then uh, Mm. Russia was kicked out, right, Mm. because of their uh, annexation of uh, Crimea. But if you look at the, the GDP and the rank of uh, list of uh, the biggest economies in the world, uh, China and India, is, they're up there, uh, but it's not considered a developed country. They're called, uh, considered a developing country. So they're not part of the G. So there's been talks about uh, Korea being part of the G8, because right. if you look at it, it's the United States, uh, Japan, Germany, UK, France, Italy and Canada, that's the G7, mm-hmm. right? And then just right after it is South Korea. And mm-hmm. South Korea actually right now has a bigger economy than Russia, which mm-hmm. used to be part of the G8. And so there's been talks before that uh, adding maybe South Korea into the group and uh, reforming the G8. But the country that was very much against it, you guys know which country was against this? Japan. Japan was against <laughs> this. They, they so wanna, ironic. They, they want to be the lone kind of mm. Asian country that's uh, in the G7. Right. But now that maybe relations are better, who right. knows? Uh, maybe there are some. There might be some talks about uh, forming a G8 again, and South Korea could be if, uh, part of that. If South Korea gets added there, then all the three countries that I lived in. Well, are congratulations, so well. <laughs> okay. You, you're you're really. <laughs> Rich, I don't know. Well, you're from a rich what? country. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for gracing us uh, in in this studio in a uh, <laughs> country that's part part of G7. <laughs> Anyways, let's continue. <laughs> speaking of countries, uh, Prime Minister Han Duk Su uh, concluded his Europe trip, uh, which includes visits to four different countries. Uh, he returned home on Wednesday. Uh, Chi, you have an overview of the outcome of the trips. Right. So just a week ago, we talked about how Prime Minister Han was going on his eight day trip to Europe. Now it uh, ended yesterday and he returned to the country. During his six night, eight day trip to Europe, he met over over 20 leaders and high level officials, uh, reaffirming the Korean government's determination to expand cooperation in fields such as defense, nuclear power, renewable energy, as well as battery. Now, participating in King Charles III's coronation, Han also asked various countries to support Seoul's bid uh, to host the 2030 World Expo in Busan. And also during the trip, Han held meetings with Britain's new uh, Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden, Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Kristersson, Austrian Chancellor uh, Kara Niemer, and uh, Romanian Prime Minister Nicolae Ciuca. And the common topics of the talks were cooperation once again in the defense industry, nuclear power generation, and new and renewable energy technology technologies uh, as well. And in particular, a government official said that uh, European countries in particular showed greater willingness to cooperate with South Korea. Uh, and this seemed stronger than, uh, than before. Now, Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister Dowden told Han that UK hopes to uh, strengthen overall security cooperation with Korea, including in the fields of cybersecurity, economic security and energy security. And uh, the other leaders of the reigning three countries also called 
commented that they would like to expand their cooperation in various fields. And President Han, uh, in return to all the comments that he heard from the leaders of the four different European countries, said that uh, the European countries, uh, they have to expand cooperation in restoring the supply chain, economic security, defense industry, and renewable energy with South Korea. And he also emphasized that uh, these states must design the future together with our country, uh, which shares common values such as freedom, democracy, and rule of law. Uh, Han also met with the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency and uh, the head of Com- the Hump- Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, where he discussed Seoul's concerns regarding Japan's discharging of its nuclear wastewater into the sea, as well as concerns related to the possible uh, seventh nuclear test that might be carried out by North Korea. Let's move on to uh, domestic politics here, something that we've been uh, trying to get, I guess, uh, an answer to. But there's been delays on the, uh, I guess, the issue over two PPP uh, lawmakers uh, over their uh, controversial remarks and uh, what kind of punishments they'll be getting from their ethics committee from the People Power Party. Uh, We have the results of this uh, in regards to Kim Jae-won and Taeyong-ho. Uh, so what, you have more on this? Right. The ruling People Power Party's Ethics Committee decided on punitive measures against the two PPP lawmakers and Supreme Council members for making a series of inappropriate remarks in the past weeks. Kim Jae-won was suspended party membership for one year and uh, Tae young ho for three months. So for Kim, that basically means that he has been stripped off the chance to take part in parliamentary elections next year. Now, Representative Tae young ho well known as a North Korean defector turned lawmaker, resigned from the Supreme Council on Wednesday. So uh, he held a surprise press conference apologizing for recent controversies and the trouble he caused to the people, the PPP and its supporters, as well as the presidential office, saying he does not want to be a burden. So his voluntary resignation appears to be the reason for why Ted just received a three-month suspension, meaning he could still seek nomination for the 2024 elections. The Ethics Committee had failed to make a decision on how to punish the two lawmakers on Monday, which is why the announcement came yesterday on Wednesday, which happens to be on the day of President Yoon's one-year anniversary in office. I don't know why reports have been uh, emphasizing this uh, coincidence, mm-hmm. but uh, anyways, and the proceedings regarding the uh, punitive measure started on May 1st. Now, um, probably you touched upon yeah. the remarks before, yeah, so yeah. maybe I won't recap the that, controversies. Yeah. Okay, so then let's move on to the next issue. All right, there you have it. <laughs> no, we, it, it's simple as I know. We did talk about it quite extensively. And uh, again, I mean, it is very, very controversial remarks. Uh, but we were talking about how, uh, despite controversies faced by the PPP and how it's going to impact them for the next uh, general elections, uh, things are also not going so well with the main opposition Democratic Party. And a uh, big question as to whether or not they'll be able to hold on to the National Assembly. And, uh, of course, facing at the center of a lot of the controversy with the DP is the DP leader, Lee Jae Young, mm-hmm. uh, who's facing multiple criminal charges. Uh, he began his pre-trial hearings today at the Seoul Central District Court. G, you have more on this? Right. So very briefly, uh, a pre-trial hearing of DP leader Lee Jae Myung, who's facing uh, criminal charges, including breach of trust, conflict of interest, corruption, bribery, etc., opened today. Uh, Lee Jae Myung faces accusations of inflicting approximately 489.5 billion won, which is about 374 million U.S. dollars, in financial damages on the publicly owned Songnam Development Corporation by approving the removal of profit-sharing restrictions on uh, the Taejangdong project we know of and enabling private contractors to embezzle large profits out of this. Now, Lee is also inc- accused of sharing confidential information with private contractors about a development project in Wide and allowing them to also gain profit of about 21.1 billion won. And on top of all this development corruption alleg- uh, allegations, Prosecutors have also charged the DP leader with accepting some 13.35 billion won in donations from companies. And although prosecutors requested an arrest warrant for Lee Jae-myung in February, the request was denied by the National Assembly, uh, whose approval is required in the case of sitting lawmakers. Lee is currently denying all the charges against him and uh, called the prosecution's investigation.
investigation politically motivated. And uh, more on the main opposition Democratic Party, uh, they've recommended their uh, representative uh, Kim Nam Gook uh, to sell off his cryptocurrency assets uh, following revelations that he owned some 800,000 WeMEX coins uh, two years ago. Let's get more on this, Soa. Yes, the, the DP's lawmaker has been facing criticism over his possession of a huge amount of cryptocurrency. The 800,000 WeMEX coins are worth some 6 billion won, or roughly 4.5 million US dollars. Uh, the cryptocurrency was issued by we made a game publisher and um, Kim's party on Wednesday said it recommended him to sell the assets off and according to a senior party spokesperson he is believed to comply an investigation is also to be launched led by Kim Byung-gi the DP secretary general in which outside experts may join the spokesperson also said that while other DP members are not subject to the investigation an expansion is being considered upon and rival parties on Thursday agreed to push for a law to make cryptocurrency and other virtual assets subject to the disclosure of annual assets of lawmakers as well as senior public servants amid the latest scandal involving Kim Nam-gook, who actually was known for having a frugal image. Uh, So the so-called Public Service Ethics Act and related laws are expected to be revised. In the meantime, we're going to finish things off with uh, news from the Cultural Heritage Administration. Uh, They announced earlier today that the Kaya Tumuli from uh, Korea's ancient Kaya Kingdom has been recommended for uh, inclusion on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Uh, Chi, let's wrap up everything with this. Right. So a cluster of tombs of Korea's ancient confederation Kaya, which is in Goryeong, North Gyeongsang Province, it's in the southeastern part of the country, has been recommended to be included on the list of World Heritages. Now, the final decision by the World Heritage Committee will be made during its 45th session, slated for September in Saudi Arabia. And during the Kaya period, some 780 tumuli of various sizes were built and uh, some of them we know that uh, burial accessories and goods that represent the Kaya Kingdom. And the seven tumuli recommended for enlistment are the Kimhae Daesongdong, Haman Marisan, Changnyeong Gyodong, uh, Songhyeondong, Namwon Yugongli, Durakli, and Jisandong. I just wanted to mention all those. Thank you very much for those information. <laughs> so it's good to have the, the I guess, the, the exact locations yes. of this. Guys, thank you very much. Also, uh, Kay, so, uh, Kay says, so, uh, well done. So you did an amazing job during the very difficult time uh, we do again appreciate your i guess your, your coverage on the COVID-19. Thank you, Kay. there you have it guys thank you guys for joining us today have a safe one we'll see you guys again see you again see you you can listen to korea now with me sj lee by downloading the arirang radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com so make sure you tune in mondays through fridays 6 p.m to 8 p.m korea time